Right, uh, just wake my... Uh, Okay, uh, my name is Stuart McIntosh. Uh, I started uh, getting involved in open source software way before it was open source software. So probably around 1994, 95, uh, after working on Novell software, Microsoft software, uh, somebody gave me a gold disk and said, try this. Uh, I'd been using Microsoft Internet Explorer, a very early version when it first came out. Uh, so my question was, where's the license, where's the SDK, where's the support? And as explained, basically just you run your own, there you go, there's the disk, see, see what you can do with it. So that's how I got into open source. Uh, and again, it wasn't called open source, it was, it was Linux, a uh, very early version of, I think, Slackware and Red Hat. Uh, what I discovered at that point is that although I didn't have any manual and I didn't have any uh, instruction, I also had no restrictions, so I could do anything. And by 1997 to 1999, uh, I constructed an e-commerce site on Perl, which we've just looked at using MySQL. And we were turning over up to a million pounds a month trading on this website, which I'd created in my spare time without any budget, without any manuals. So that was a good point to kind of evaluate what I was doing in the computer hardware market and think, well, actually, maybe there's something else I can do here. So that's the point where I started uh, a business. And uh, I, I didn't necessarily set out to start a business. I set out to solve business problems, to implement free software, the software I could find, I could do anything I wanted with, into businesses. I had a business partner who was sales and commercial. Uh, the, my business partner, shortly after we started the business, lost the, he didn't quite grasp what I was trying to do. And I don't, don't blame him because you know, telling people in, in the world of the, the, the dot-com days, people making huge amounts of money using uh, Microsoft technologies and uh, lots of other technologies, people didn't believe that free software was ever going to go anywhere. It seemed a bit crazy. It didn't make any sense. So, uh, so we kind of, we, we didn't have any um, kind of commercial basis for the business. It was about solutions. Uh, so we went our separate ways, and I had to learn how to run businesses. That's, that's how I started. Uh, so it was experiments. I had to experiment not just with technology, not just with software, but also with my business, experiment how I could sell, how I could survive, how I can pay the bills based on giving away software, and also how my clients could, uh, how, how their solutions should, should work. They were asking me to solve problems that they didn't yet understand. There was these new, uh, new e-commerce functions, new collaboration functions, all these new things going on, and no one quite understood them. So I was trying to experiment in all these different ways at the same time. So effectively, I just learned how to experiment, learned how to fail fast, learned a lot of the things that uh, Tarek was talking about earlier by, by doing. So, uh, so what's this all about? It's a new chapter. So, uh, what, what I see now is that uh, businesses built around open source are going to be the future. That we've heard from, uh, from Rob there that there are there's some challenging times ahead, trying to work out what these business models are. Uh, we will find them. We will work out what they are. I'll talk a little bit more about what I think they are and, and, and the things that I've learned and how I've uh, found things that work. And also with the Open Source Consortium, what my aspirations are with the, the, the Open Source Consortium. So uh, yeah, I'll share with you a little bit more about what I see this, this shift being, where we were and where we're going to. So the excuse. and. Uh, the suppliers, the, the open source suppliers sometimes say no one buys open source. In fact, many people in the technology world, and there's not really a good word for it, it's not IT. IT is a different thing, uh, technology is broader, but we need to find a better word. But what I hear in the, in the supply side of open source, no one buys it, they just help themselves to it, it's, it's free. <coughs> On the other side, I hear this, I've, I've sat in groups with Tarek and his colleagues and they've said, well, no one sells open source. I can't, I can't get it. Where do I get open source from? So there's a, there's, there's a gap here, and we'll talk more about that gap. So open source will underpin the next chapter of technology, the innovations, the future. It will be based on that. It already is, but that will become more obvious uh, as we go ahead. Uh, and what we need to do is build an industry around it, a thriving industry. So the, my view, the software supply model has been broken. Software. Uh, it, it doesn't, software doesn't work like physical items, but we've been led to believe that. The, the market's been conditioned 
to assume that software will wear out, that it will stop working, that you should upgrade, that, that the, next, the next black box is better than this black box. And many people have been conditioned to that view. Sometimes I say this to people and they'll say, well, that's not true, I get it, I understand it. And then they tell me about their Windows 10 upgrade. And I, and I ask, well, why did you do that? What is it you didn't have that you, you feel you need and that that has given you? And th there isn't really a, a solid answer for that. Uh, it's just that's what you need to do. And of course, when you do that, you then may need to buy some more hardware. And then, so you're in that cycle. And that cycle isn't necessarily the, the most healthy cycle that people can be, people can be in. Uh, and there's lots of artificial constraints that have been designed into software to make people think this. So it's designed to stop you using it past a certain number of users or a certain number of days or a certain size. Constraints are designed around software. They're not limitations of software. They're limitations designed by the companies who would like you to believe those limitations that you then have to buy more software. The behavior became acceptable. It was the standard way of doing business. It's been the way that, uh, for years, businesses have made a lot of money. There's a, a few companies have generated huge profits, not in line with the value that they're delivering. So they're, they're not providing that level of value. They're generating profits. And when you do the maths, you think, well, it, it, the two don't, they don't balance. There's a lot of money being generated, not a lot of value being generated. They've been very commercially successful. And there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with commercial success. Uh, it's about the, the user. What does the user get from it? What value does the user get for the investment that they're making? So the innovation, there's been lots of innovation over the years, but a lot of that innovation has been around the packaging, around the commercial model. The innovation isn't around what can you guys as a user get from this? What, what can you do that you couldn't do before? How can you exploit uh, modern technologies or new communities? But the, the, the innovation is really has been how it's been sold and, and how it could be packaged for more profit uh, and, and so on. So that's, that's how it's been. And I think, uh, echoing what uh, Rob was saying, this is, there is a change. Things are different now. Uh, so we'll talk about where it's going. So um, we can talk about the, the case did study of the wheel. Let's just uh, jump back. So, uh, yeah, so the case study uh, here is that the, the caveman had technical challenges. And we can look at that technical challenge. We have technical challenges today. Um, if they want to move something from one place to another, someone discovers it's easier if you stick something round under it. And it's, it seems obvious now. Uh, but what if they were able to hide it? What if we didn't see what that thing was? It's still there, it's just that we can't see it, it's, it's obscured. So the, the person who owns this black box is going to do quite well for it because he can show the benefit of, of what his black box provides. And uh, if you want to have the benefit of having a wheel, then you have to buy this guy's wheel because you can't see how it works. Um, the caveman's going to be a little better off who uh, invests in this, and, but the, the supply will become a lot better off and civilization will advance a little bit. Luckily, it wasn't hidden. As it wasn't hidden, lots of things have wheels now. You know, imagine if we didn't have wheels in anything, nothing, nothing would work. So luckily, there's, there wasn't a way of obscuring that technology. People can innovate all sorts of different things. There's a million things, a billion things that use wheels all over the place. Um, so this, this might seem obvious. You might think that's trivial. It's, it's a wheel. We all knew that. But this is the same situation with software. If we can see it, if we can use it, we can apply it in different ways. Every one of us can choose how we can pick that piece of software up, that, that connector that joins a web service to a web browser or, or a mobile phone to a, a database, we can all pick that up and think, well, actually, I'm going to use this for something different. I'm going to get different data from that database, something that no one's come to me with. I've just had that idea, and I can just do it. So if we can see how these components work, we can all innovate. And all of our iterative innovations working together will create a lot of differences. So. We think about the, uh, the open model, which is an alternative way of thinking. I, I won't say a new way, because as I've just explained with the wheel, it's, it's not a new way of thinking. It's just that in technology, it, we've actually, we're, we're at the very start of technology. We, we might say, well, our, our kids have been brought up. In fact, we've been brought up during the era of computing. But 
in the, in the big picture, we're at the very, very few, first few seconds in the big picture of, of technology, 50 years or so, 50, 60, 70 years of, of, of the existence of computing, 20 or 30 years of this common understanding of computing. If you look at steam engines, they were 30 or 40 years while they were very basic, hardly operational, they were patented, people couldn't share them. So, so that we, we look back at all the, uh, all the innovations in the, in the steam engines for 150 years, but it did take a while to, to kick off. And we're just past that first embryonic, embryonic stage. So um, let's look at this model and how it can work. So open source is the future. I think that's why people are here. You, you'd probably be somewhere else today if you didn't really, if you, didn't, if you dismissed open source, if you didn't think that that view was of any interest. We're here to talk about open source in business. So you're here because you, you get that already. Um, but hopefully this can, this very simple analogy, it is a simple analogy, can help you understand that the, the impact that this will make in the future, it's, it, it's, it is going to have significant uh, impact in 50 years time, it's going to be a very, very different place. It's worth noting, I don't have any issue with proprietary software, I'm not anti-Microsoft, anti-Apple, I'm not, it's, it's not like that. Uh, I'm pretty neutral, I just think this is the best way. And I chose this because back when I started in the technology, I, I wasn't religious about it. I didn't have any view one way or the other. I just discovered that I could do anything with open source. And if I didn't use open source, I couldn't do anything. So it was a very pragmatic uh, assessment. And I had no reason to choose either, either way. So I'm not anti-proprietary. It's had its day. It's had its time. Um, and now it's time for something different. So, let's look at uh, what the proprietary vendors have done for us. So, they've done the pre-sales for us. They've sold the dream. That's what the proprietary <coughs> vendors have done already, which is good. It was expensive. They've, they've sold lots of problems, solved lots of problems. They've invested in marketing. They've, uh, they've told the world that they can benefit from IT, from technology, from computers. So, uh, for, for many years, they've been propagating these messages. So if, if it wasn't for that, we'd still be in the day where people would be saying, why do I need that computer? What could I do with it? So the proprietary vendors have done very well at, uh, at, at building that marketplace. If you look at Red Hat, what they did, excellent. They found a marketplace of Unix vendors. And it was a very big, expensive marketplace, very robust. Red Hat came along and looked at that model and looked at whether they could provide the same outcome for less money on a different platform. And that's what they did. They, they went in there and said, swap your Unix, your, your proprietary software, for Red Hat software, but do the same things. It's just going to cost you less money. So if it wasn't for the proprietary Unix vendors creating that marketplace, Red Hat would not have been able to take over that space and make the inroads that they've made. And if, we, if you go and look at Red Hat, you'll see that they're doing quite well off, off that. Um, so there's the opportunities. There's lots of opportunities for, for everybody in open source. You just need to find those places where people are already doing things the old way and use your open source skills to allow people to do the same things or ideally better in the new ways. Um, so we've all got the opportunity to do this. It'll allow users to do more with less. Why not? Okay, so <coughs> software is different to other things. Software doesn't conform to the laws of physics. It doesn't wear out. It can't be consumed. So this is from what I was saying earlier, one of the main fundamental differences with software to other business models. You, the proprietary model has been very much telling people your software wears out, using a, a model that's there to sell physical things, but there to sell software. So it's a, it's a fundamental difference. Um, you might say, well, my software crashes. It doesn't work properly. Those things do happen, but it's not because the software wore out. There's some key, ar key areas that cause problems with software. It might be capacity, it might be you've run out of disk space. It could be your platform's not available anymore because a, a wire's failed. It may it never did the thing anyway. Uh, uh, you, know, it, you might think, well, it did it yesterday. Well, you may have been doing something different yesterday, but software doesn't wear it, it doesn't break. Software keeps doing what it always has done. It might be you've changed what you want. That's a, that's a common problem with software. The software works fine, it hasn't worn out, it hasn't broken, you've just changed what you want it to do. Uh, it might be something's changed the software, a virus or something, uh, or there's a bug that's always been there, you just never found it. The proprietary model is designed to make it look like it wears out, it looks like it breaks, it looks like it's run out of capacity, 
but that's not software, that's just the packaging, uh, and that's part of the problem. Uh, the open source model, of course, has no benefit in trying to perpetuate that, that myth because actually it's, it's about the value, it's about the, the, the things that go around the software rather than the software itself. So, despite the power and dominance in the industry of the proprietary vendors, and you count the numbers, there's a lot of, a lot of money gets turned over, billions of pounds. Uh, I think the government stats a couple of years ago was 20 billion a year that they spend on technology, and that's just one customer. If you look at the corporates, you look at how much you spend, it, it is hundreds of billions. So it's a big marketplace. Despite that dominance, uh, there's been other models that have emerged. They wouldn't have emerged if there wasn't a need for them. So if you're up against a marketplace which is turning over hundreds of billions of pounds, and yet still there's space for other models to emerge, there must be some, some use in those other models. And these are these open models. They've been around, the, the, the principles have been around since software started. The very early days of software, people would have just shared software. They would have looked at it and improved it collaboratively. So they've always been there. It's just that they've been in a non-commercial world. They've, they've existed in a community world. So we have this, on one side, this huge marketplace of software, which is worth hundreds of billions. And on the other side, we have probably in, in actual value, an equivalent marketplace where money hasn't traditionally changed hands. It's been effort, exchange of, of effort, community, collaboration. Uh, so open source in the non-commercial world has meant all sorts of different things to different people. So it's been maybe a community activity. There are business models. There's been smaller business models in open source. A production model, it's a way of building the things that you build, a way of supplying what you supply, a way of securing what you've got. Pricing model, there, there's all sorts of different reasons. A marketing model, people writing software and putting it out there in the open world, and a, a customer service model. There's different models that have been used, but these haven't been commercially focused models. So the outcome of some of these business models, which we haven't gone and bought. Uh, I don't remember anyone buying the internet. You know, no, one, no one put a PO together and said, I'd like to have an internet, please. It's, it just happened. So that's the outcome of these models, which evidence is that they have been there. We wouldn't have the internet if the free models weren't active and alive. Uh, and the internet of things, another great word for the internet, um, and that has lots of gadgets, which again, previously, th they didn't just come from nowhere, they didn't just get uh, magicked into existence, they've been developed for many years. All of the, 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 the background functions and technology of the Internet of Things, of these millions of gadgets which are now becoming connected, have been in, in development for 10, 20 years. Um, just, again, outside the commercial world. So it's, uh, it's evidence that, that things are happening. Every TV, I hired a car in France a few weeks back and turned it on, and on the sat-nav it says open source licenses. You know, it's everywhere. I don't, I don't need to look for open source anymore. I just, wherever I look, it's, it's there. So what do we need to do? Um, the industry is functioning, technically, in, in uh, that word literally as well as uh, more generally. It, 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 is, it is functioning, it's there technically. But both sides need to make changes. Both sides, the side of the, the buyer and the supplier, both sides. We need to build some bridges. And we need to make a bridge between this huge open source industry, which has been around forever, as long as software's been around, and the, the people who spend money on software. And we need to join the two together. Um, so there needs to be changes on both sides. The suppliers need to design their models on delivery of value. Rob was explaining earlier some of the changes in, in his model. It's, it, there is a, a commoditization of software. The value, the software itself becomes free. So it's not a question of can I get access to that software. It's what's the package that surrounds the acquisition of that software. Uh, and so, so we need to have these, these business models for the, the sellers need to be very much value based. The buyers need to be open to these new ways of working. Um, and they need to work together with the, the buyers and suppliers need to work together to find that middle ground which allows the supplier to put the effort in to deliver the right solution and for the buyer to be comfortable they've got it and they can pay for it. So, so that's the, the gap that needs to, needs to happen. It's great to hear Tarek talking as he regularly does about the, the government's appetite for this to happen. Uh, that, that is the, the best case study. The more we can see the, the public sector 
evidencing that they can find ways to do it. The, we will see industry catching up. Uh, and actually, again, in industry, when it invests, it is ultimately getting open source in many, many cases. It's just that they're not consciously buying open source. Many of them just adopt it. They spend money on things that don't work, and they just happen to be adopting open source uh, through the back door without necessarily acknowledging that. So we, we need to do some work there. So, um, so very much for me, it's been a journey of discovery, working out what my way is, how, how I'm going to do this. And, and so this is very quickly what I've found uh, <coughs> works for, for me and for, for my business. Value and innovation, actually. That's it. So nice and simple. means a lot of things to different people, but it's about value and innovation. I don't know what else to, to, to say to that. That's what people want. People pay for it. Value to, is different to different people, but you know, that's... That's up to the, the, the specific commercial discussion at the time. So we import open source, open standards, open data. So someone might come along and say, I'd like you to build me a, a, a finance system that I can run my business from. It needs to connect to my upstream suppliers' data. It needs to be able to export data to my customers. So, so we're importing open source. We'll go and find the right open source. The software is free to us. We say to our customers, you can help yourself to it. It's free. Go and, go and help yourself. And if you want to use us, you can. We're not going to lock you in, because why would we do that? You, you'll use us because you like us. It keeps us good. It keeps us true, because that's the only, the only lock-in is our value. We, we do a good job. So we import uh, a lot of open source. The customer might say to us, well, well what, if I can help myself, what, what are you doing here? So the, the answer is value. What, what, what we'll do is we'll choose the right open source. We know the right software. We'll go and select the very right open source. We'll see how we integrate it together into other bits of open source. Um, but there's some critical parts about our process, which I'll, I'll touch in a moment, which is, is, the, is the really important bit. We also export. So if we import a bit of software and we find a bug in it, we don't phone up the supplier and say, can you fix this for me? Uh, in the proprietary world, you might have said, well, I've got a support contract. I've, I've bought my... I, I don't want to bang on about Windows. I'm not anti-Microsoft, but it's a nice, easy example. You, you, you can't phone Bill up and say, look, Bill, it's crashed on me can you fix it? it you're not going to get anywhere so in the open source world you get more than that you, you, you don't it, the perception that you get less support in open source is, is actually inverse because in your proprietary world your license generally says you've bought this software you've paid me money to sign a license to say you've got no rights to any of it I can take it away when I want to take it away and maybe I'll force you to pay more money in a year's time to keep using it or something else where the open source world you don't have those constraints and when you think about support, you can go online and probably talk to the author, the guy who wrote that particular thing on IRC, on an email, uh, and say, can you fix it? And they, they'll probably say, yeah, I will. Great, thank you. That's really valuable. You've logged that problem with me. Yes, I'll fix it, but I'll get round to it next month because it's not my day job. For them, it's a, it's a, it may be a hobby or something else. You have the choice then of saying, well, let me give you them some money if, I, if, if they work like that. And here, I'd like you to fix it when I want it, and here's, here's some money to help you think about that. So there's models, there's ways that, uh, that, that you can use the community, you can interact with it. And every part of the community works differently. Sometimes it's one person, sometimes there's, there's a thousand people. The truck factor, the bus factor is a very interesting thing to look at if you want to look at the how many people sit behind a particular project and effectively the truck factor, how many people have to get run over by a truck before the project fails. It's a very interesting way of looking at it, at least in the open industry, people look at it that way. They, they think about, well, what if? In a proprietary company, you don't get access to these things. So you know, a guy can leave and the software grinds to a halt. You, just, you don't have the option of, of having another way. So we try and give back anyway, uh, in all sorts of ways to the community, by filing bugs, writing documentation. Um, th there's all sorts of ways. It, uh, supporting the open source cons consortium, you know, that's a way that we give back to the community. Uh, we were doing some work with um, the Open Forum Europe and helping out with the plug fest with the open document format. So we invest a certain amount of our time in the community and in, in the projects and, and in giving back. So there's other models. Um, and actually, I just will touch on professional services regarding our model, and that is that the, the way that we sell open source is we have a process, and what we say is that we have a successful implementation process. Success isn't about successfully giving you the software. Success, it means, my definition of success is it does what you need it to do. And that is down to your business need. So we're very 
uh, the first thing we do is find out what the requirements are and when we hear the customer's requirement we generally then pull it to pieces and work out what the real needs are because their requirements are very much confused with what the computer does now rather than what the neat underlying business reasons are. So that's, part of the, that's the first part of success and then once we understand what the problems are to solve then we design a plan, implement it. Implementation is a big thing, it includes the, the cultural change. The cultural change is the biggest riskiest part of implementing software. Getting the people who've pressed the same button for the last 10 years to think about it differently and maybe not even press a button because that button doesn't need to be pressed anymore uh, and that cultural change is, is difficult. That's all part of the solution, especially with ERP systems where you, everybody in an organisation is, is, is immediately uh, affected by the changes. If, it's a, if you're just dealing with the sysadmins, you've got a different set of challenges which generally aren't the same level of cultural problems, but in the business there, there's a whole lot of cultural problems and training and uh, the, the whole package. So these are the kind of things that that is part of our professional services package. But uh, there's a lot of models out there. So professional services, training, certification. Certification is an interesting one. It's been uh, around for a while where uh, Magento, you can become a, a certified Magento engineer and, and you pay for that. But then once you've reached that, that level, then people will, will buy you in a different way and give you money in a different way. Uh, Open Core was touched on earlier. Uh, proprietary extensions or dual, dual licensing. So there's, there's other methods there where you can write software which is a, a basic set of things and you can say to people either create your own extensions and th which will take you time or money or buy ours. So it's a model. Um, there's different views of these, some we like more, some we like less, but these are the, the ways people make money out of software. Partner networks, there's, there's other networks where you can uh, spend a certain amount of money to become a member. And actually, in some respects, that's marketing. It's, it's someone who's selling the brand, and you're cooperatively investing in them to promote the brand. Uh, memberships as well, so, uh, and subscriptions. Software as a service, build your free software, give it away to everybody, but charge people to use it. So you might say, well, I've created this, this content management system. It's called uh, WordPress. It's really good. Help yourself to it. Or you can pay me £5 a month, and I'll let you use it so you don't have to worry about that infrastructure, uh, rental, subscription. Advertising and marketing, um, you might charge, you might have Google Ads that might fund your project depending on what it is. Um, you might find that you can, if you're in a particular vertical, if you're in a healthcare vertical, it may be that you can just sell a, a, a specific banner in a specific market for a very large amount of money, potentially. That may cover the cost for you to develop it, either full-time or in your spare time. Sometimes it's wrapped with hardware, you, you buy a router, you basically you're buying open source on a piece of hardware but it's packaged. Crowdfunding, pre-post, so you can say, I'm going to build this, will you fund it? Or you could say, I've built this, will you fund it? Donations and bounties. Uh, so there's all sorts of different models. There's lots of ways. They're all about value. Nothing here is about taking anything away. It's all about saying, here it is, have it, help yourself to it. And if you want my services to help you achieve the things that you need to achieve, these are the, these are the models that you pay for it. It changes the whole paradigm of innovation. Because, again, the only option you've got if you're delivering these is excellent service and innovation. They're the only, only choices. You need to choose the model for you. So it may be uh, a, a voyage of discovery. It's not like there's one model anymore. Just like in retail, it's not like there's one channel. It's not like you can just use telesales anymore. In retail, you've got a 1,000 channels now that you have to use, and you have to get one customer on each channel. With open source, you need to find, look at all the di different models, work out what works for you. If it's not working for you, it may be that you're either in a, market, in a marketplace that wants value and you're trying to do something cheaper. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes in the open source marketplace. Someone will think, well, I'm worth £50 an hour, £100 an hour, choose your number. You know, it sounds, well, it sounds like a lot of money for every hour of a working day. It sounds quite reasonable. But you can only afford to do so many things in that time. Maybe the customer would prefer that you had five people one of them who could go out and sit with them, shake their hands, talk them through, press the buttons for them, give them a hug, you know, all these things, all the soft side of it. And that actually they'll pay for that because they need it. They haven't got anyone in their business who cares about the software and who can take them through that journey. Where you might get someone else who actually they're very technical, they just want more hands on keyboards. So then it's a, it's a different model. So if you're looking to start a business, if you're looking to get involved in an open source business, uh, you, you do need to look at what your, your aspirations are, look at your strengths, your skills, what can you bring to companies. 
and, and find that right model for you. We need to build the marketplace. That's, for me, what it's about. The reason I'm here today and what I'm uh, encouraging the Open Source Consortium to do is build a marketplace of buyers and suppliers. We need to stimulate this marketplace. It has to, it does take both sides to do their bit. We need the, the, the suppliers to up their game and look presentable <coughs> and be accessible, visible and accessible. And we need the, the, the buyers need to come to this marketplace and accept that it is a really solid marketplace. It may not look like it yet, but everything's being built on it. And, and get out of this habit of, on one side, paying a lot of money for things that don't work, whilst just adopting open source with the other hand, not paying for it, uh, and, and finding things just work. I, I heard a, a case study, an uh, anecdotal um, public sector um, uh, story of the week where somebody said that they, they bought a CRM system, spent three months getting it on board, a lot of money, and when it came to go live, it wasn't usable. So rather than being embarrassed and saying, let's go back and, and, and say it didn't work and start again, or even argue with the supplier, it took about two or three weeks for the techies to dig them out of a hole just by launching an open source solution, and the whole thing worked. Now, procurement were very happy. It was a success. They spent the money, got their solution. You know, everyone won. But the, the ironic bit about that is that the bit about spending money in the procurement bit just didn't need to happen. That they just didn't need to do that. So, and that, that, that's a story I see a few, quite a few times. We, we need to change that. So the, the supply side needs to, to up its game. The buy side needs to be open to this. It's over to you guys. You, you, you guys need to think about that. You need to work out what models you're going to put together and how you're going to change the market. Thank you.